Hello traders, it is Friday, November the 4th. This is John Kick, Glider Chief Strategist for DailyFX.com. Here to give you your FX market wrap-up for this past 24 hours of trade, and more importantly, an outlook for what we can expect in the final 24 hours of this trading week. Now, taking a clear and consistent assessment of exactly what has happened this past 24 hours is very important. We had two particularly large moves, one more thematic, the other very concentrated in the British pound specifically. I'd like to actually start out with the higher profile move the one that is likely to continue into the coming day and uh, into next week. And that is the orientation of risk sentiment that we've seen and we continue to see here with the S&P 500. Actually, this is the ETF, the spider. Now, this is my preferred benchmark for risk because, as I've said many times before, it is stubborn. It, it will hold up better on a risk orientation than virtually anything else out there. In fact, when we look at the standings of risk, not the short term, not, not month or 12 month, but I'm talking long term. Since the bottoming of the great financial crisis, we see that the S&P 500 is bar none. Uh, the most aggressive uh, leaning for a hawkish or sorry bullish outlook. So with that being said, knowing that if th the S&P 500 is dropping, that it must uh, have a considerable uh, reading on sentiment itself amongst those various assets, uh, I do think that it's quite remarkable that we continue to slide to new multi-month lows. Now this decline has certainly put us at a, uh, or the lowest level that we've seen since early July. So that is very impressive. Uh, but let's put some statistics behind this. You don't really, say, well, the volume behind this is certainly perked up a little bit, but if this were a critical break, especially on something that could be construed as a head and shoulders pattern, uh, I would not really say that this is the volume that I would expect behind such a move, and it's certainly not the pace I would expect. You can't really see it on the spider ETF due to the close, but if you look at the uh, market for the S&P 500, the actual index itself, it is worth noting that this is, and I've seen this statistic uh, uh, put out there on a number of uh, a number of places, but it is a eight consecutive uh, day decline. That uh, right there is a 200-day moving average. All right, so eight straight days of decline. For histor historical context, we haven't had an eight straight day decline since back in 2008. And yes, that actually happened to be a short-term bottom, although it didn't actually bottom out uh, uh, post-financial crisis. Let's take a look at some of the uh, past two uh, seven-day declines. That two was the bottom of that uh, dramatic pull back in August 2011, and we eventually found our bottom here and the subsequent pullback in November of 2011. So the interest, if we were talking about this on a statistical basis, would be, hey, this is a bottom. The big picture technical perspective would say this is just the beginning of a turn in sentiment on an asset class or a benchmark for an asset class that has just been uh, consistently complacent and advances to the upside. Another aspect to consider here is the lack of pace. While we might have a remarkable eight day decline, when you look at the rate of change in this move, here's the eight day rate of change, that really doesn't add up to a significant move at all. It's only the biggest decline in uh, eight day decline that we've seen in just a couple of months. Not anywhere comparable even to the post Brexit, the December to Jan and January pullback, and certainly not the August plunge that we had last year. So what does this say to us in terms of sentiment? I don't think that uh, there's any doubt that there is a risk uh, wind behind this. We can see it not just in something as stubborn as the S&P 500, we see it pretty much across the globe. All right, the DAX, the FTSE 100, uh, the Nikkei 225, all of those have shown that kind of risk aversion. Furthermore, other assets that uh, hopefully are becoming more and more familiar to you now are also showing that sentiment slide. Emerging markets, high yield fixed income, even commodities. You can use commodity index, but uh, I think 
no need, just use oil. So we have a consistent move, and when we have a, a move with such breadth, uh, something that draws otherwise disparate markets together with some degree of momentum, and this is a moderate degree of momentum, it is indicative of risk aversion. And I do think that this is indeed risk aversion. In fact, I'd put it up uh, somewhere in this territory. So it is in a greater intensity, but it is not unleashed. It's not the, uh, something that the market is going to be able to carry through uh, with little uh, provocation. It needs a catalyst. It needs something to actually provide uh, a, a removal of the restraint. And I don't think that we're going to remove that restraint until we are clearer on the major event risk that we have next week, which is specifically Tuesday, reading or the outcome not to be uh, interpreted until Tuesday evening into Wednesday morning for Asia session. That's the U.S. presidential election. That is quite clearly a high-level risk uh, for the market's perspective. And we can see this high-level risk in the charts that we've been uh, following. I actually found the data for the polling. Uh, this is real clear politics. Uh, and there are dramatically different polls out there. Uh, there are sample surveys, there are time frames, there are uh, natural audience. Th those are all going to be considerations of why they differ. This was unfortunately the only one I can get. If I could find all the data, I would be making all the charts, or I'd at least uh, make all the charts and average them all out. Uh, but this is the standing of Hillary Clinton, according to Real Clear Politics, and the standing of Donald Trump in terms of the percentage of votes that would come through. Uh, the gray in the background is the differential, uh, Clinton minus Trump. But I don't, I'm not into politics, it's not, and that's not why I would care about this. And uh, what I really care about is what, how it impacts the market. So what I did was I took that differential and I overlaid it to market benchmarks, the S&P 500, for example. And we've seen that the narrowing of this, uh, this debate or this uh, standoff, this campaign, uh, has certainly helped to motivate some declines in risk trends recently, uh, back in September and certainly uh, currently. And that makes sense. It's not that one candidate is worse than the other necessarily, but what it recommends is uncertainty. We can't really prepare, and we don't know who is going to be the person to come out on top. So it makes sense, especially as we come into uh, the wire, down to the wire. We are now uh, less than five days away from that election. Uh, it becomes a greater sense of urgency, of uncertainty. Here is the dollar's performance against those, uh, uh, this balance. There might be something here too, although it's not long term. I think recent uh, relationships will show that same uh, correlation through intensity and, and proximity. Here we have volatility. All right? The closer the race, the more uncertain the circumstances from the market's perspective. Volatility is now the highest we've seen since the Brexit. And everyone's favorite uh, measure of U.S. political standing uh, that, uh, as of late, has been the dollar peso exchange rate. That has been inverted here because uh, that's where you get the one-to-one -one correlation. But you can certainly see that this still stands as a pretty good relationship, and it's perhaps a little bit more intense. Although, as I've said many times before, this is not a perfect indicator. Don't use this as a measure for the election. Instead, see how it responds, and you can also get uh, a very good assessment of how the election standings and risk trends are having differing uh, influence on this particular benchmark. All right, but this is definitely a situation in which the uncertainty is greater now than even in previous elections. Here's the volatility index 20 days into, uh, into the election compared to the previous elections over the lifetime of the VIX volatility index. So that goes back to 1990. 
So as you can see, this is starting 20 days from the election uh, relative to that starting point. We are higher at this current juncture, uh, uh, less than uh, three trading days uh, away from the actual vote, uh, than we've ever been in, in an election year. So high level of uncertainty and anxiety. That being said, the S&P 500, relatively speaking, this is the bright red line, is lower, but it's not uh, fully uh, into its momentum. There is not conviction that this is a uh, dire situation necessarily. It just puts people on guard. The uncertainty is high, but the risk aversion doesn't necessarily uh, come without the actual fire that people are f uh, frightful of. So we don't really have a full-scale risk aversion move. If you are looking at this and you are uh, pursuing it as a risk-oriented position, I would be very cautious. Expecting this to follow through without the clarity of how that uh, event on Tuesday is going to play out is a considerable uncertainty, and you are going to have to take a, something of a gamble of the outcome. Not the outcome of the actual election, but the outcome of how markets will respond to the election results. And that is itself difficult to do. If you were looking for something that would absolutely uh, cater better to the risk aversion, I wouldn't go for something like the S&P 500 uh, or even other uh, more intense risk-oriented uh, benchmarks like the emerging market and high-yield ETFs. I certainly wouldn't be looking at the yen crosses, which have been very stubborn in moving on risk-oriented trends uh, uh, to begin with. So why would I treat them as uh, something very sensitive all of a sudden? Um, I would look instead to volatility. All right? This is an assumption of activity. Now, the traditional approach is to go long uh, volatility when the uncertainty rises. The, the market makers are the ones that sell the volatility, presuming that it is perhaps too rich relative to what its actual uh, market impact could be. Very, it's a very dangerous game nowadays, uh, however, considering how low volatility is ultimately and how uncertain, yes, this event actually uh, looks in the, in the circumstances of these markets. But the VIX and certainly a lot of interest in that very short-term VXX, the short-term volatility index, which I've said many times before, is flawed in its design. Hence why it continues to drop, despite the fact that the actual short-term volatility finds a natural bottom and has found a natural bottom for some months, much like the VIX itself. But that hasn't uh, dissuaded, uh, uh, hasn't dissuaded traders. Uh, we actually see from a volume perspective that uh, volume is much higher, despite the fact that we've gone to new record lows. Uh, also, this happens to be a, another instance where we have an eight consecutive trading day upside move, which in the short lifetime of the short-term volatility index, that is a record. All right. So this is where you would actually see uh, uncertainty take advantage of the circumstances. But if you're looking for an outright risk view, that's going to be a very presumptuous. It's going to be tough to find follow through. Uh, and it's probably going to lead to the kind of uncertain trades that most of us would want to avoid. All right. So risk absolutely is engaged and it's going to entice a lot of people, especially when you have uh, setups that look like uh, what we have from the S&P 500 could be a head and shoulders pattern. But you have to consider the backdrop. You have to consider the market that you're operating in. And there is a lot of presumption that's going to be made and a lot of uncertainty that still uh, sits ahead. Now, since we'll continue on, I think we'll continue on the risk theme and then move on to some of the other uh, big moves in the market. But we do have another spark that we could potentially get between now and the U.S. election, and that comes with the upcoming session's non-farm payrolls. Right. U.S. NFPs certainly does cater to important moves in the past. We've seen employment figures uh, jumpstart risk on, risk off. We've also seen it fuel interest rate expectations. Those are two critical themes within the market. The problem is that non-farm payrolls 
as important as it is as an economic benchmark, as important as it is for gauging interest rate expectations, uh, which November interest rate expectations are set still very high, just short, shy of 80% according to Fed funds futures. But it is very tough to concentrate on something like this in its most capable form, which is changing interest rate expectations, when we are preoccupied by an event that per perhaps won't have the level of volatility that markets are pricing in, but in the meantime, it is too great a distraction. I definitely think that this is capable of generating volatility. I just don't think that it's going to be able to fuel the trends that many people are looking for, especially when uh, the weekend and then Tuesday are going to uh, preoccupy most people's thoughts. I cover this event in more detail in the strategy video, so you can see it there. But for most intents and purposes, this non-farm payrolls event is not going to be a uh, bellwether or a catalyst for big risk-oriented moves. It can provide some movement for the dollar, however, as this is not as intensely uh, connected to the risk theme. And we will see that the more distant interest rate speculation to the end of the year can potentially cater uh, to this market's move, uh, though choose your pair wisely. If we were looking at interest rate expectations on the dollar side, I do think that uh, something like the Aussie dollar could, uh, could supply some movement there. It hasn't been aligning itself very well to risk on risk off, so it's much more capable on that front. Uh, we could also consider the Kiwi USD, which we'll talk about more tomorrow because we have an RBA, RBNZ rate decision next week in which the RBNZ is actually expected to cut by 25 basis points to 1.75%, a new record low. While that is still a much higher yield than the U.S., when we're talking about what actually moves the markets via monetary policy, it's the change rather than the, the standing level that really motivates the markets. So this could actually uh, cater to a, a clear signal on interest rate expectations. One of the best, or two of the best, however, are the Euro USD, all right, which has certainly shown an increase in volatility, a little bit more consistency in trend, which is very attractive. This is also a, a more distant cousin of a risk-oriented trend. So this can actually cater to interest rate expectations that arise from non-farm payrolls. But I think one of the most capable is the pound dollar, all right? And one, because it's received some motivation this past session. Two, it's not uh, particularly exposed to risk trends, although uh, the Brexit uh, fears have certainly imbued it in, in it a uh, degree of uh, uncertainty, which people will respond to. But we've also seen a change in tax specifically from the pound. Let's go down to the four-hour chart, because that's uh, tough to get a grasp on, given the, the momentum. Let's go further down, an hourly chart. This incredible run was in part motivated this past session by the Bank of England. All right. The Bank of England essentially kept most of its uh, elements in place, so the really low yield, their quantitative easing program, their uncertainty about the future, and uh, their caution about Brexit, uh, uh, post-Brexit uh, UK, but they also squash interest rate expectations for further cuts. While certainly not a suggestion that rate hikes are on the way, it does move us back from this exceptional easing policy view. So a constantly expanding dovish view, which would be a constantly pressurized uh, dovish or bearish outcome for the sterling. Easing that back moves us up the curve and in turn lifts the pound. So this already gets us on the view of an interest rate uh, comparison. And thereby, it could be a better candidate for responding to that theme. Now, let's speak a little bit more about the pound itself. This past session was notable for that BOE rate decision, which I did a strategy video on, uh, but I missed out a, uh, on a, a critical component. I thought it was going to be a non-event, how wrong I was. The movement that we had in the pound this past session was not derived uh, predominantly from that Bank of England uh, modest uh, neutral shift, but rather it came from a high court ruling in the UK that uh, said that Parliament should have a say 
in the execution of Brexit. All right. Now that's not to say that the uh, the, the parliament, the government, is going to uh, essentially sabotage uh, the Brexit vote and uh, Theresa May and her cabinet's uh, efforts to push forward with a uh, breakup with the European Union. But what it does suggest is that the parliament ca could instead say, uh, we're not going to uh, give up access to the single market for a uh, full control over immigration if it comes down to that negotiations. So it would potentially give power to Parliament to say no on a hard Brexit. It could also mean a, a, a significant if not indefinite delay on the actual processing of this, although Prime Minister May has suggested that that will not be the case. She still expects to, to operate under the late March time frame for invoking Article 50. But you can see that the market takes this to be a positive thing for the sterling. I think it has more to do with the uh, vote on how the Brexit will be approached and perhaps the avoidance of a hard Brexit. The loss to the EU single market uh, is certainly a negative for the UK. So this started the British pound, and like I said, the pound dollar is going to be interesting because the non-farm payrolls can actually uh, play off of this already uh, significant move. But we had some noteworthy moves elsewhere. Euro pound, as I said, uh, when the if the pound got a good, good push would be a good uh, opportunity. You can see we got back down, uh, testing that uh, one month low, although it didn't really hold there just yet, hourly chart. All right. The pound yen despite the fact that the pound was quite strong, would not be able to break above this uh, pretty consistent resistance, former support. All of this falling right around 128.75. That's quite remarkable, especially given the really tight congestion pattern that this has uh, developed. So why isn't it able to break 128.50, uh, 129? Because you're not getting uh, a full-scale bullish view on the pound that can override what is also keeping the steady stagnant that is risk trends. All right, it's not overriding risk trends. Those are competing themes. This is an effort to go for risk appetite, risk on, and that is very difficult to accomplish. I like to avoid fundamental themes that clash. When they align, that is a great opportunity. These do not align at the moment. If you really want to see a pound-based cross that is really technically enticing, we have the pound uh, Aussie. Going down on the four-hour chart, you can see that this has a pattern that looks like an inverse head and shoulders. Uh, the 161 neckline was broken with this news, and it seems that even on this time frame that there's a lot of upside potential. On a longer time frame, there is considerably more potential. In fact, this is such a dramatic move over the past year that it looks like the early signs of a major trend. But I urge caution. This is very presumptu uh, presumptuous that this is going to be a reversal. This is essentially picking a bottom. And picking a bottom is a low probability game. It is very difficult to do, and it is essentially pocked with risk. Now, for the pound, it's not necessarily uh, facing any known threats necessarily over the next 24 hours, uh, at least not to the scale necessary to uh, change the winds of the of sentiment for the sterling. All right, we do have some lower tier event risk that uh, is known, uh, but nothing of significance. Next week, it's uh, another list of noteworthy data, but certainly not high profile event risk and if we want to see this taken to the Supreme Court uh, the in the high courts rulings that's not out until uh, early December supposedly they haven't set a firm date but that's a long time to let this play out so there is potential here I just want us to think in terms of what kind of risk am I adopting for what kind of return and always think about the probabilities 
Now outside of this event risk, the pound and risk trends, and the non-farm payrolls, there is certainly some uh, other event risk that I think is worthy of our time. I would say look at the European Union sovereign debt rating, which will come likely later in the day. Uh, that's going to be by Moody's. As I've said too many times before, the euro is at risk of the Brexit, uh, and it's not given the proper scale, the proper influence. It is very important, and yet the markets haven't given its uh, dues. The euro is still relatively strong. So watch this. Also for the euro, we have the Commerce Bank uh, earnings, which most of the focus has been on Deutsche Bank. Commerce Bank is in a unfavorable position of its own. So if we want to get a good sense of how the uh, w the Europe's largest uh, economy is doing, this is a good place to look. Uh, also, the Canadian employment data. Do not write off the Canadian dollar. Dollar CAD has been stuck in a very tight range as of the past two weeks. That's remarkable given that the dollar itself has been very active, the dollar index, and oil itself has also been very active. The thing is, what motivates the dollar CAD most prominently is the dollar and oil. And both things are dropping at a pretty equal uh, pace. So what we end up having here is offsetting themes. Now risk trends, uh, as it motivates oil, as we know, can r remain. The dollar's uh, sensitivity to risk trends is probably going to cool, but non-farm payrolls reaction is going to probably be a consideration. So we have to take that in con into account with the dollar CAD. But the deciding factor here may actually be the Canadian employment figures. If it is significant, if there's a major surprise, especially if the non-farm payrolls from the U.S. are essentially in line, that's going to be a, po a potential huge catalyst for a break here. I don't know about follow-through. Right? There's definitely some risk sensitivity. There's some dollar exposure, obviously, here. Uh, and we will see that correlation to oil reconnect. But in the short-term appeal, there might be some good volatility and perhaps some trade opportunity, depending on what type of, t type of trader you are. Now heading into the non-farm payrolls and into the U.S. election, I would say keep an eye on gold. All right, it's been rising, and I think that that has certainly a uh, attachment to the uncertainties with the election, as well as the uh, unfavorable winds for the dollar, and not much in the way of uh, rebound for the euro, pound, and yen, even though uh, the latter of those two actually saw a significant rebound. Uh, and that uh, means one thing, that people can't go to one of the primary reserves, so in turn, they're going to go to an alter alternative to traditional currencies. My only trade that I had on is the Aussie Yen. It has it actually pulled up from its lows. I already hit my first target, trailed my stop to break even plus 50. Uh, we haven't got back up to that uh, trailed stop, but as you can see, we might not reach the bottom of this range. This is probably more in the hands of risk trends now. So. Uh, the longer I hold it, the greater the risk, so I may actually just uh, book the second half of profit uh, and not at the ideal position, obviously. Uh, we'll see what uh, tomorrow brings. Aside from that, there are some interesting currency pairs out there, but it's very difficult to get away from uh, these very uh, pressing themes. Uh, pairs like the Aussie Cat even will have the Canadian employment figures. It is difficult, very difficult, uh, to get away from uh, one of these big tumultuous uh, developments. Uh, perhaps an Aussie Kiwi, for example, might be one alternative. But it doesn't necessarily offer the best trading uh, circumstances in itself. All right, so assess what we we are seeing, what is possible, but do be mindful about what you should expect with these big provocative developments, uh, given the uncertainties that lie ahead. All right, I will wrap it up here. We'll do our uh, next and final rundown for the week, as well as an L for next week uh, tomorrow. Until then. I wish you good luck trading out there.